Okay, good evening. This is the September 22nd Planning Commission public hearing. Can I start with roll call, please? Rob Rusher. Brian Adams. Lou Tatora. And Rich, I think you were, you're joining us? I am here, Rich Levy. Welcome. Uh, before we begin with agenda items this evening, is anybody here to speak uh, public comment on something not on tonight's agenda? So you can come down, give us your name and address and your thoughts. See, nobody... Uh, then we'll get to agenda item number one, which is PL 2022-0241, excuse me, Indian Meadows Subdivision, La Quinta Employee Housing. Is the applicant here for a presentation? Hi, my name is Scott Myler. I'm the architect. Um, I will make this really short for you. Owners of uh, La Quinta find it necessary to house their employees. And um, I think uh, they should be commended for keeping this as a hotel. We've seen a lot of hotels get changed to long-term rentals. And I think it's important to keep hotels in our community. <clears throat> um, so they felt if they're gonna provide housing that they, that they needed to be a little uh, separate from the hotel. I mean, you could always, take a unit inside the hotel and um, put them in it, but then pretty soon people are knocking on your doors and it's, it's just kind of very nice for an employee to have their own space. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about placement. The Southwest corner has always been open in this spot and um, kind of shielded behind some big, almost like a forest from landscaping from 1997. So it's gonna go there. And uh, we feel it fits the existing building uh, as well as the new addition that we're constructing right now on the north end. So this is kind of the bookend on the south to the north end uh, that's under construction as we speak. The staff report covers all the CDC requirements pretty well, and um, we'll uh, leave it at that. Thanks for your time. And any questions, I'll be here. Thanks very much. And does staff have a presentation as well? Sure. Toby Stoffer, Senior Planner. This is um, a project to add two workforce housing units to the existing Looking to Hotel property. Um, the property is developed with the existing hotel, zoning is CC, and surrounding uses include lodging, multiple family residential, dormitory, and commercial development. The two units will be deed restricted as workforce units. Um, the project requires a public hearing based on the total existing and proposed square footage on the property, so no variances are proposed, but the square footage is why it's in front of you tonight. The workforce housing is a limited permitted use in the CC zone district. Um, I've got the use standards listed on page three of the staff report. We find that this proposed use does meet all of the standards. We did review this project against um, section 438 design standards for an accessory building um, in the commercial and mixed use uh, design standards section. We do find that the building is complementary to the principal building and is screened with the existing and proposed landscaping. And it also meets all of the um, design guidelines or design standards for this zone district and area. Uh, we find that the project is consistent with the character and complements the mix of uses, activities, and structures. Um, we also find that um, the development plan does provide adequate access. Uh, there is existing access on the property that is used for the hotel, and it will also be used for the workforce housing units. The project will restripe the parking lot. Um, currently, the parking spaces are wider than our standard, so they were able to restripe the parking lot um, and add enough parking spaces for the number of rooms in the hotel and for the workforce units. Um, there is an existing dumpster on, dumpster on the site that will be enclosed, and the new building will be connected to existing sidewalks and utilities that are on the property. With that, we find that the development plan is consistent with the criteria of approval, and we are recommending approval with the conditions on page five of the staff report. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from commissioners?
look like you have one, so I'm pausing on you, but yeah, not ready yet. Um, or from Rich as well, if, if he's ready for a question, you're gonna have to jump in. Okay. Um, yeah, I briefly looked and I wasn't able to find anything. So I'm just gonna ask, cause I couldn't find anything. Um, were there any limitations on hotels in adding workforce housing specifically? Not in our code. We would probably, if they wanted to add it, so if they wanted to add it in the building, um, that would just be a mixed use and it would still be an accessory use and it could be, um, still could be workforce units if they wanted to add rooms in there. Parking and all the other standards would apply and there are no other restrictions on hotel uses or on having more than one use on a property. So it meets all of our sort of broad general standards. Okay, and these new developments, it would not be able to be rented out as a hotel room. It would have to remain workforce housing or housing for somebody. Yeah, that's correct. So that the limitations of those units are stipulated in that workforce deed restriction that will right. be recorded before the building permit is issued for those units. All right, that's it. Now just, just making sure, thank you. Any other questions? I didn't have any other. Uh, any uh, public comment for this agenda item? If so, you can come down. I was just jumping at that. I'm going to assume no public comment. Um, unless you had any final follow-up uh, as the applicant. Okay. Then we'll close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. I'm going to motion to approve PL 2022-0241 for approval with recommended conditions. A motion and a second. Any discussion? I'll jump in and kind of reiterate, uh, kind of based off of your questions, that those questions and the fact that I saw that those T's had been crossed, I's had been dotted, are exactly why I think this is a pretty simple, approvable uh, project. Um, you know, mitigates any issues with the existing building, with neighboring buildings, and uh, I think makes sense. And I'm glad to see some workforce housing for the building. I agree. I, I concur. And I, like I said, I asked the question just so that I was 100% positive. So I, I appreciate that staff. Great. Then I will call the question. Aye. 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 Rich? Aye. Thank you. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Our next uh, public hearing for decision this evening, agenda item number two is PL 2022-0158, the In It Steamboat. Uh, is the applicant here for a presentation? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, let's yes. see who's our... Oh, I believe he's online. Online, excuse me. Sorry about that, Mr. Walker. Uh, yeah, go ahead when you're ready. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Mark Walker. I'm president of Resort Group. I'm sorry I could not be there in person. I'm at a business conference. And I did think that uh, this would be, and I do believe, rather simple. Um, we did a lot of detective work before we purchased the Inn Steamboat and closed in May of this year and learned that one of the things I needed to get accomplished was to convert it from a hotel to a dormitory style because I'm going to be having folks in there from a seasonal perspective and a long-term pers perspective. So I thought it'd be a pretty simple switch uh, to change, but um, what I would like to address on my presentation, because it's very straightforward, um, is just a couple of the unfortunate negative arguments from uh, neighborhood folks. And I thought I would just take a moment during my presentation time to address some of those. So uh, number one, short-term rentals is the business that I'm in. And ironically, there's a lot of community feedback that they don't want short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods. For me, this caught me off guard that now I'm hearing some folks where we purchased this hotel that are flipping the story on me and saying that they don't want long-term hardworking folks as tenants in their neighborhood, as it may decrease their property value. And I'm really scratching my head on this one. Um, resort group, just to give everybody kind of an update on who we are, uh, we stepped up in a big way, from my opinion, in a lot of the business community people I talked to, to help solve our employee housing crisis. 
and we all know that it's a crisis. We put our money where our mouth is and paid substantial amount for this property. We are offering exceptional rent for our employees and a great housing option. And the beauty is this will open up additional rooms for others in this community that can't find a place. For some, this is the first experience of coming to Steamboat. It's their first property. It's a stepping stone to get on their feet to move up and live here for many, many years to come. A lot of them are first timer steamboats. Uh, we recruit heavily. My hope is that many people start at our property at the Inn at Steamboat and work for us and eventually grow into the service sector of our community and be long-term residents. I remember when I moved here 30 years ago and where I lived in ski core housing my first year. Um, another factor that I wanna address that came through in an email was this ambulance and fire truck scenario. And this is a really important one to me because I want to be an exceptional, not a good neighbor. I want to be an exceptional neighbor to the folks that live in that area. It's a beautiful part of town, but we are a professional management company. This is what we do. Resort Group manages over 5,000 homeowners that put their trust in us and over 100 homeowners associations, which is what I now call what the Init Steamboat is. I have about 160 full-time year round employees and that number jumps up to, to about 325 or 350 employees in the wintertime. We have won the best of the boat, best property management company three years in a row. We have great culture and we are a great contributor back to this community. And most important, we are not some third party hedge fund company that bought this property that doesn't live here in town. We make our decisions and we're locally owned right here we're right here and we're doing it to benefit our employees. We're not looking to profit off this housing. In fact, I'm going to be subsidizing it crazily. But this is for our employees and our community. So back to the ambulance and fire truck. I do have an explanation for this. And it is my apologies to those in the neighborhood. But when we bought the place, there was a cookie oven in the community kitchen downstairs that cooked cookies in the afternoon for the guest. Well, that's commercial oven and it heats up super fast. And when we first took over the property, we had some employees that put their food in there, treating it like a regular oven. Well, it smoked dramatically, called, hit the fire alarms and called the fire truck. That happened once and we got it to smoke down and it wasn't any issue. And unfortunately, we weren't able to just unplug it because it's hardwired in. And about a week and a half later, it happened a second time. Since then, because it's hard to get contractors, we did get an electrician. We got it disconnected. The cookie oven is in the garage up top. I'm looking to sell it, and we replaced it with a regular oven, and we've put a whole bunch of high-end ventilating system in, in the property. So those are the two situations that I'm aware of regarding a fire truck and an ambulance. One more situation did occur, and that was an employee of ours that was staying at the Inn at Steamboat that got sick. And they got, they talked to their, their mother that lives out of state and their mother was concerned and called the ambulance and the ambulance came up and the employee was just fine. I think they just overreacted. Bottom line is we are using this property for our employees. We've done this for years. I've had the Alpiner downtown, Main Street. We've stayed at the Flower Mill and most recently at the Mountain Lodge. And we know what we are doing. I have an on-site manager 24-7. Recently, I have an upper management team that lives in an apartment on the end of the Inn at Steamboat. So I have two critical people keeping the peace and keeping an eye on everything there. We have night maintenance at our company till 11. We have security for all of our other properties. Anyone can call us at any time if there's a problem. I want to be a great neighbor. Someone else mentioned about, are there going to be kids on the property? Uh, there won't be any kids on this property. These are hardworking young adults and also seasonal folks that are older that do housekeeping, laundry, front desk, or shuttle drivers. These aren't crazy, I don't want to use the word lift ops or certain people. These are people here to make money and work hard. A lot of them don't have cars. Some do have cars that are there year round. Some that's seasonal in the wintertime don't come with cars. We won't have any parking issues. We won't even use all the parking spaces. I have fact bought this in at Steamboat Shuttle that will actually help us transport some of our employees from the inn in the morning to our business and then at the end of the day back home. We have done everything. I've been working on this conditional use permit change since May. We have done everything that Mr. Keenan has asked us to do. So in final, I take great pride in this building for our employees. 
so much so that I hired the general manager and assistant general manager from the Init Steamboat that has the historical knowledge of the property. They are now grown in our company, but can help keep an eye on the property as well. I'm hoping that this property will be an enhancement to the neighborhood and will actually create less noise and less traffic. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Does staff have a presentation as well? I do, Rebecca Bessie, Planning Director. Um, so as Mr. Walker indicated, this um, application is for a conditional use to convert the existing Inn at Steamboat Hotel use into a dormitory to serve uh, the resort group's employees. The property is zoned MF3, multiple family three, which is intended to allow for a variety of residential uses. Uh, the property has 34 occupiable units, three of which are two bedroom suites and the remainder are single rooms. Um, what we understand is being proposed is that their maximum occupancy would be two persons per single bedroom unit and up to four persons per two bedroom um, unit would be proposed for a total occupancy of 74 residents maximum. There are 44 parking spaces provided on site. Per our code for dormitory use, only 19 spaces are required. Um, I did also want to note that the, the multiple family zone district as written in the code today, prohibits hotel use. So the current use, while it was, um, I believe, approved years, many years ago through a conditional use process simil similar to this, um, today under our current code, the use is non-conforming and not in keeping with the multiple family zone district. Uh, no substantive improvements to the exterior of the building are proposed. And um, we did require that the applicant add some bike racks to the property um, to provide for some uh, bike parking. Uh, we did receive some public comments. I think those were all forwarded to Planning Commission as well as included in the packet. Um, and staff is recommending approval with the three proposed conditions noted in the staff report. Great, thank you very much. Questions from commissioners? I had a, a question regarding uh, management of the facility. Um, given that it is a dormitory and most dormitories typically have, I think back to college, we always had an, uh, an RA, uh, somebody in charge that was making sure all of the residents of the dormitory were acting in accordance with rules and laws and stuff like that. Um, I, from I, I didn't hear that that was the case here. Like there, there's not a resident that will be the manager of the property. Is is that correct? Um, I'm going to defer that to Mr. Walker, but I, I understood that he indicated there were several employees living on site managing the property, but we'll, I'll, I'll defer to him. That is correct. I currently have, and since we took over the property, have an on site resident manager that lives there. And we will continue to do so as well as on-site management that stays in the apartment. So we'll literally have three types of people that will be on-site management. Did you have a follow-up? No, I, I, I get it. And I'm, I'm just wondering if those people are managers in the company or they actually know their role in living there is to be the manager of the property. That, that's a great question. Um, two of them that live in the apartment are managers for the company that keep an eye on it, but the resident manager has a list of duties and responsibility, um, cleaning up, mowing the lawn, as well as primarily keeping the peace and make sure there's not noise issues. And that person actually gets discounted rent to live there in return for providing those services. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Rich, I see your hand up if you have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I'll start with staff, uh, excuse me, the applicant. Is there any controls for like a, a lease agreement? What, how do you control turnover and how frequent could turnover possibly happen? Well, turnover is actually very rare. I don't think it's even happened other than us letting a couple of employees go. Um, primarily they stay, whether it's a year lease or whether it's a seasonal lease for the summer or the winter time. Um, I have an occupants agreement and a lease and one of our companies under the resort group 
um, umbrella is MR Realty. And that division of our company actually manages and executes the leases and takes the security deposits and reviews the rooms and the procedures. We have monthly meetings with all staff members. Um, that's, that's, that's how we do it, very professional. And the follow-ups, are, are you saying every resident there will be on a lease? Absolutely, yes, sir. If you're still on a roll, Rich, uh, if you have another question. I'm good, thank you. Good. Who did you have any questions? Uh, I don't believe I have any at this time either. Um, is there any public comment for this agenda item? So you can come down, state your name and address and give us your thoughts and try and keep them to three minutes. Seeing none, uh, Mark, uh, nope. Uh, then unless, uh, Mark, did you, if you had any final follow-up, uh, this would be your chance. No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Or from staff. No, thank you. Okay. We'll close the public portion. Come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. The only thing that I find interesting here or upsetting perhaps is, you know, the, a change from a, again, more hotel loss in our community. Um, and it's being converted into long-term rentals, which I have absolutely no problem with. Um, I am a little concerned that uh, we're losing a lot of our hotel capacity. Now, obviously I think it's a, an economic issue. Uh, it's hard to run a hotel and this is an older hotel that's been around for quite a few years. Um, and I suspect that uh, leads into this. However, the impact this has of providing uh, workforce housing is substantial. And uh, I'm very supportive of it. I agree. I, I applaud the resort group for taking this under their own uh, accord and, and providing housing to their employees. Um, you know, this puts people that live in the community actually in the community, turning it from a hotel into uh, apartments, if you will, uh, for those people, um, provided that it's managed uh, the way a dormitory should be managed. I think it's an, a good addition to the community. Um, and that's why I had the questions about management to make sure that it's just not a dormitory run amok kind of thing in the middle of the neighborhood, um, which was, I think, the concern that I saw in the, um, the public comments that we saw coming in. Um, given that, I, I actually, I, I feel a lot more comfortable uh, with voting for this one. Yeah, and I, I would just agree with you both and and add that, especially given where it is in town. And, and of course, we've recently gone through this process of, you know, where should rental places be, where, where are more residential, uh, you know, in opposition. And this being in an MF3 zone district, as, as Rebecca had mentioned, um, its location and its ability to provide exactly what we're trying to get towards in our town as, as a... Uh, service industry housing, uh, uh, that kind of use, I think is fantastic. Um, my only concern coming into it was being dormitory as opposed to simply multifamily. And what did the dormitory mean as well? And I think you touched on that probably even more eloquently is kind of how does that get managed? What are the impacts to neighbors that might be different than just all the other multifamily that's already around there, uh, multifamily use? Um, but kind of what their their answer and how that's being done, uh, I think I think it is mitigated, and that was kind of my only concern. So um, I think if there were such a motion to uh, to approve, uh, I would be in support of it. Rich, do you have anything? If either one of you want to make a motion, no, no other comment. No comment. Okay. All right. A motion to approve PL 2022-0158 with associated conditions. We have a motion. 
Do we have a second? second? We have a motion and a second, unless there's any final discussion, which I doubt. And then I'll call the question. Aye. 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 And Rich? Aye. Okay. That motion passes unanimously. All right. Thanks, Mark. Moving on to agenda item number three this evening, uh, items for recommendation to council. This is PL 2021-0017, Wild Horse Meadows filing nine. Is the applicant here for a presentation? Hi, good evening. I'm Brian Mistician representing RCS, the owner of this 13 acre site. Uh, RCS is based in Louisville, Colorado, and we're excited to be presenting this subdivision for approval this evening. I'd be happy to chat and answer any questions later. And in the meantime, uh, RCS has its expert land planning uh, consultants, Peter Patton of Patton Associates and Jeff Lake here to present uh, on our behalf in more detail, so. Thanks, Brian. Peter Patton with Patton Associates again. And uh, we have a pretty brief presentation if you wanna go ahead and Oh, here's the remote. There should be. What is the power button? Perfect. Thanks, Kelly. So um, this is uh, Wild Horse Meadows filing nine. Um, and uh, we'll just oh, start with a little background. Everybody's obviously familiar with Wild Horse Meadows. It's our lower ski base. I was the original land planner and project manager for Wild Horse Meadows. We, we did the planning in 04 and 05, and then our approvals from the city were done in 06. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of development since then, the last 16 years out there, what isn't developed is the area in yellow. That's this is the originally approved PUD. Um, so underneath there, you can see where some of the buildings, it was a very detailed, and I'm gonna flip back and forth. This, this shows, this is a graphic perspective of actually what was approved. So it was a very detailed PUD with uh, all kinds of different uh, types of, of units. And of course, Trailhead Lodge, you know, um, launched it uh, many years ago, 607 units on 47 acres. And the remaining portion, which is vacant and why we're here tonight is 13.8 acres of uh, vacant land, it's, it's as you can see on kind of the perimeter, it's along Mount Warner Circle or Mount Warner Road. Um, there was a development agreement that expired after 10 years. Um, there was some zoning changes in 2018. Uh, basically, it's probably too complicated uh, to, uh, to get into, but it, there's kind of a hybrid zoning, but it's essentially RR1 zoning, which is ski base type zoning. Um, this is simply taking this 13.8 acres and dividing it up into three parcels that will be developed by, it'll be sold, each one will be sold to developers in the future, and they will come in and develop each parcel going through the process 
with you guys development plans. So this is just strictly a subdivision. There is no development proposed. Um, again, this is the perspective of what was approved and the red boundaries here represent essentially the parcels that we are now trying to create. So parcel one, is is what we've always talked about as the hotel parcel and it's adjacent to the gondola and then you, you start on the perimeter um, along mount werner road and and you've got um sloped parcels there that are townhomes and mixed use stuff um this is what it looks like today this is existing conditions um Actually, there's a few more buildings there um, uh, today, but this is essentially uh, looking, you know, obviously up the mountain toward the east. And this is the last time I'll turn the table on you. We're gonna we're gonna be looking at north up from here on, but um, I think everybody understands, you know, where we are here. So um, the red boundary generally shows the 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 outlawed a which is the property we're subdividing into three parcels and this is um the yellow area is outlawed a um and this is now and will continue to be north up so um the intersection the new roundabout is right here um you know these roads are all in uh, this road is roughed in, okay, and it has been since 07. And so we've got a parcel here, a parcel here, and a parcel here, as you'll see on the plat. Parcel one is, again, that flat area next to the gondola that, you know, may or may not be a hotel. It was always kind of, um, our vision was that there'd be a nice hotel there base of the gondola and trailhead lodge is in here. The parcel two is um, along the road here, kind of narrow and long. And then parcel three actually um, originally was two different um, parcels divided by this road, but we've combined it. So um, again, we're, we're kind of redoing what was done in 07 or 06 and, and, and approved. And, and the, Kelly did a great job in the staff report talking about all that history. And, and this is this was never developed, it's vacant. So we're, we're kind of putting it back together. So open space is 15%. Um, there's two general areas of open space under the gondola here uh, will be designated open space. And then on the south portion here, um, and there's a lot of stuff in here already, <laughs> snow making lines, uh, water lines. Um, there's a lot of easements here for various utilities, electric line, uh, YVA is in there. Um, so that's the, the second kind of chunk of open space. Um, and then these show the, the various parcel sizes um, with that, that parcel three being the uh, largest. Um, the utilities, because this project started, I mean, it was approved in 06 and it was constructed in 07 for utilities and infrastructure. So in 07, construction drawings were approved and, and these roads were built. Um, so utilities and infrastructure are there, there. the water and sewers there, um, the roads and the other utilities are existing and they were installed in 2007 uh, because the project was approved and moving forward and under construction. So there's not a whole lot to discuss there. Um, so there's one subdivision improvement that's required um, per the master trails plan, which is ProStar is the fancy name for the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, Trails plan. And uh, this is uh, a drawing of what is required by that plan and by the planning staff. So we're prepared to do an improvements agreement 
um, for this trail. Uh, we don't necessarily agree with the design of the trail, but uh, this is what we're told is being required. And so this would be uh, moving forward part of an improvements agreement that is uh, slightly extended in its term. So it's possible in the future, this trail, um, the zigzags may get straightened out a little bit, may get redesigned a little bit. Um, a couple other things were, we're eliminating a lot that it isn't crystal clear exactly why it was created. Lot one filing six, which is this little, why doesn't it go there? This little area right here is a lot that was created in 2016, probably for drainage purposes and possibly for entry landscaping purposes, but it doesn't really serve any purpose and should be absorbed into parcel two. So that's what we're proposing. And then the drainage, um, this maybe shows a lot one a little better here, but so, and then there's a drainage easement that's kind of in a very structured straight line configuration here. We're, we're proposing that the yellow piece of that be vacated. It is no longer needed. And, and that this part of that drainage easement where there are drainage improvements be retained. And you guys aren't voting on this easement vacation, this goes to council. But I thought because it's part of the plat, I just pointed out. Um, so the variance that's in front of you tonight is uh, for slopes, usable lot areas. Um, so there's history here. Um, the, the graphic shows um, light blue and dark blue. Um, those areas uh, that are colored in blue, either one of those shades are over 30%. The current code um, requires, um, and the, the purpose of this, um, the current code is that steep slopes that are defined as 30% plus, natural existing uh, slopes, steep slopes be avoided in new subdivisions, okay? Just don't build on the steep stuff. So that, that's the current code. Um, this project, however, as I've explained, was approved in 06 um, to allow the slopes that are out there today. So these are constructed slopes. They're not natural and existing. And some of them were constructed uh, uh, when Mount Werner Road, way back when Mount Werner Road was built, um, that uh, adjacent to that made some of those slopes steep. And then the, the road, uh, this road was constructed and steepened this area. This road is roughed in and steep in some of the, the adjacent areas. So these were all approved with construction drawings in 2007 and then built, um, but the, there's a technicality, if you will, uh, because the current code doesn't allow this. So we're requesting a variance for those existing slopes. And again, I think the staff report is very clear with giving you the background and the reasons why um, the, the, it meets the criteria, uh, it meets the, the hardship criteria. And, uh, you know, we can talk more about this if you want to, but uh, I think the staff report handles it quite well. Um, that's it. We appreciate the Planning Commission's time and, and we're requesting, um, you know, we agree with the staff report um, that these two proposals, the preliminary plat, the major variants uh, are consistent with the criteria. And um, again, we appreciate your time and request approval for those two applications this evening. And uh, obviously we are here to answer questions. Good. Thank you very much. You want, okay, Kelly's up. Does staff have a presentation as well? I do. Kelly Douglas, senior planner. 
Um, this is the preliminary plot and major variance application. The subject site is comprised of two existing uh, legal lots. They're located on the west side of Mount Warner Road, Mount Warner Circle, um, and they extend from the intersection with Steamboat Boulevard to the intersection with Eagle Ridge Drive. With respect to zoning, uh, the underlying zoning of the property is Resort Residential 1. Um, in addition, the property was included in the 2006 Wild Horse Meadows Development Plan, uh, Planned Unit Development, and Preliminary Plat for a Master Planned Pedestrian Oriented Community. Um, standards related to setbacks, height, commercial density, and use were adjusted with these approvals. And uh, those aspects of that plan are vested in uh, perpetuity or until amended. So it's a unique aspect of this subject property. A significant, as you saw in the presentation, um, a significant portion of the original development has been built out over time. However, the subject property, uh, it remains vacant. So with this preliminary app application, the applicant is proposing to reconfigure these two lots into a three lot subdivision. And the proposal includes a major variance to section 602D3 usable lot area and 603F2 residential uh, grading and drainage, both standards relate to steep slopes. Staff supports uh, varying both standards on the grounds of unnecessary hardship. Um, with respect to uh, 602 D3 usable lot area, the standard requires that areas of lots where the existing slope exceeds 30% be designated as unbuildable. Um, application of the standard would only allow for approximately 13% of the gross uh, lot area parcel two to be utilized and approximately 24% of the gross lot area parcel three to be utilized. So that's significantly less than the 50% minimum allowed by the RR1 zone district. Um, regarding the variance requested to 603 F2, um, this standard requires that slopes on individual lots not exceed three to one within the required lot line setback area. Um, this standard was not in place at the time when DP0603 slash PP0602 uh, were approved. Those are the applications with the vested approval. Um, and it applies in this case because one of the vested acts aspects of the PUD is a residential use. So yeah, that's a, another unique aspect of uh, this subject property and its uh, development history. Overall, uh, there's no evident practical alternative to including sleeps, steep slopes <laughs> in usable lot area and setback areas. Um, application of 602D3 and 602 603 F2 would significantly reduce, if not preclude, uh, the future development potential of each parcel. Therefore, uh, staff finds that the criteria for approval for preliminary plat and major variances are met, and we're recommending approval with conditions. A handful of calls were received from surrounding property owners with, with questions, uh, mostly clarifications related to the map that was on the surrounding property owner notice. Uh, but no, no formal public comment was received in support or opposition. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's do commissioner questions. I might start with one if that's okay, um, high level. Uh, so Kelly, the reason why this is before us tonight is because they're changing two lots into three lots, right? So it's a new subdivision and therefore requiring a new preliminary plot. Correct. Otherwise, like you were saying, there's already vested abilities within the outlaw as it currently exists, if they were not trying to create more or less legal properties, this wouldn't have even come before us, I would presume. Yeah, I do believe it needed to be platted as an outlaw. Oh. Um, there's also major variances. Um, also, the, pre the preliminary plat and other aspects of the development plan are expired. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of things that are yeah, putting this application in this process before you. Okay. And, and as it stands though, being this three lot subdivision of sorts, uh, if the, what was that parcel three is the smallest one to the South. Is that right? Parcel three gets developed in kind of the way it was originally intended, uh, 
20 years ago or so um, into like duplexes, triplexes, multifamily, I assume that it will need to get preliminary platted again to create new properties again? Uh, well, I think it depends on the development that we see there. There's a certain amount of commercial um, development anticipated in that area that's evident in the PUD that's vested. So whatever development is proposed, it will go through the appropriate CDC process well, that's fair. And in today's code. Yeah. And, and the reason why I ask is because if we're taking a look at the steep slopes as it exists for this subdivision, but then any likely multifamily subdivision probably brings it forward again, are they going to have to jump through the same hoops? Or if they get this variance approved now, will that be able to carry through so that they're not having to rethink steep slopes in the future? I really think it comes down to the, we can't anticipate what type of development or subdivision will be proposed or needed. One may dictate the other. What I can say is that the same, you know, the criteria for approval will still be in place. If a new preliminary plat is required for some reason and the same variances are required, then we may rely on a similar justification at this point, we we can't um, we can't anticipate a future subdivision. Um, but if the conditions are the same, then you know the conditions are the same. But right, it's hard to anticipate what may come. Well, no, no matter who builds, it'll still be as steep as it is now, right? So that'll still exist. Yeah. Okay, that's probably all I had for now. If there's other questions. Yeah, I, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, so with the, the grade of the, the land being over 30%, is that based on the natural grade or the adjusted grade because of, or does it matter? It's the existing grade. So it's as it is today. Uh, that could be through natural or uh, other forces. <laughs> okay. And you know, just recently I was watching a thing on Italy and Greece and everything, and they're building houses on these really steep things. And I and it comes to mind, and I'm just like, why do we have a 30% grade thing that we're really worried about when they build on the sides of mountains in other places? So would you mind giving me a little history on why we have that in place? Is there something you can help me with? Um, I don't know the hit. I don't know what the rationale or, I mean, I don't know when that standard in the code came in, came in to place. Um, but I do believe that there are some recommendations in the area community plan that talk about preserving our, um, sensitive and natural areas. And part of those, what's included in oftentimes included in those sensitive areas are areas of steep slopes. So I, I would imagine it was probably rooted in something that came out of the community area plan that was adopted in 2004, but I, I don't know the exact history of when that standard was um, added to the code. Okay. Is, is there a, a building rationale that might back that up that says, hey, it's unsafe, it causes excessive erosion, some, something to that nature, and that's why we have that? Um, I would imagine that that those um, considerations are part of that. I mean, certainly I think there's ways to engineer like pretty much, you know, a whole lot of things that maybe are possible, but not necessarily desirable. Um, but again, I, I don't know what all of the uh, considerations were at the time that that standard was adopted. I just know that um, our steep slopes in our community are identified as those being greater than 30%. And that we consider those sensitive areas, and and yes, I do believe that there's probably erosion, um, stability concerns, um, drainage, those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, this is, a, I guess, a question for the applicant. Um, we're we're going through the process of taking two properties and making it into three properties, for all practical purposes. Uh, I assume the motivation here is somehow making this into three properties is going to make the all of the properties more developable or more attractive for development. And, and I'd like to hear your rationale behind that. So 
So, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> A couple of things come to mind. Um, one is, as I mentioned in the presentation, we're, we're attempting to go back to what was approved. What you see tonight has already been approved, right? And the, the, so these, these parcel boundaries are very close to what was approved. And, and so there's lots of plans and, and lots of um, details um, that are already in place. Now the development agreement is expired, but all this stuff still exists. And so there's there, there's those reasons that we have the the plans and the documents that are based upon these parcel configurations. I mean, we did architectural details, floor plans for every building. Um, so this helps us um, in terms of developers coming in, uh, we can provide that background information to them. And as long as it fits the zoning, um, you know, the other reason is that for the chances that uh, a developer is going to come in and buy the, all of this land as a chunk, um, are pretty small and, and they're different types of uses likely with each one. Um, so breaking them into smaller parcels is, is, is going to uh, facilitate uh, development. Right. To, to, to add to Peter's point where he was headed is it's a practical consideration that two of the sites lend themselves to some form of lower density townhouse type development and the lower quote unquote hotel site lends itself perhaps to a hotel product. So uh, the end user, the end developer will likely be uh, a combination, one perhaps a, a housing developer and then the other perhaps a hotel focused developer. So achieving this subdivision helps us uh, uh, achieve the end goal of finding the specialist end user and developer for each of the sites with the appropriate specialization. Thank you. I hope you're right. Rich, I see your hand up. Do you have questions? Uh, I did for the staff. Can you tell us the reasoning for the pretty strange looking sidewalk connection? Um, there was, you're referring to the trail connection. Um, is that right, yeah. Rich? Yeah. Yes. Um, that, that, uh, that location was initially envisioned with the 2006 approval. And it has also been identified in the poster. Please don't quiz me on the acronym. It's the Parks and Recreation Open, open Space Trails and River. Yes. Um, it's also identified in that plan. Our subdivision standards um, point to our development, uh, complete street, multi-mode standards. Um, so all those things together require this trail. I'm sorry, guess what I'm asking? Is there, I assume that there's a grade reason to, to make that trail three to four times longer than the actual distance between Bangtail and Mount Warner Circle. Why does that? configuration look the way it does? Um, that's what the applicants proposed. And I think a lot of it, yes, is a true is attributed to grade. It's steep. It's also sort of uh, existing somewhat. Um, there is a kind of a social trail in that area. It's not paved at this time or doesn't really have a formal surface, but um, there there is a a clear need in that folks are using it right now. Well, I certainly understand the need. Uh, the applicant made it sound like the city is requiring it to be built that way. The current permits have expired. So what are we requiring? I, we certainly should be requiring a connection. Does Why does the correct connection have to look the way it's drawn in the, in the presentation? Um, staff disagrees with the applicant's characterization of the 
of the trails development. This is a proposal by the applicant. Uh, the city is open to it, uh, certainly open to changes um, that, you know, in line with our process, uh, but this is, uh, yeah, we kind of disagree with that characterization, but this is what we've agreed on um, for the time being. Like I said, within our, pro we have process for changes along these lines for our substantial conformance process. Um, if that comes to light, it can also be uh, bonded for, um, for a period of five years. Uh, so it, th there is some, some time to sort out details if the applicant finds that this design is not um, the best fit for them. Also civil construction drawings are required. Uh, so we'll be proving out, we'll be reviewing it further as it becomes more eminent. Rich, can I follow up on that? I was going to say that. I'm, I'm just going to just, uh, I know that there's 70 feet of vertical gain on there, right? Looking at their drawings. Um, could that have been steps? Could that have been a combination or are there, and maybe this is really maybe the root of what we're trying to get towards. Is there a set of guidelines that the city has that requires the 5% max that's kind of shown on the drawings and 2% at corners and kind of more ADA related type things is something like that driving it from the city's end. Most of the review, the review of this trail has been, our engineering department has been working with the applicant on this. Um, so I can't speak to all the specifics. I'd be getting out of my lane a little bit, but I know that compliance with ADA standards isn't require isn't a requirement of this trail. Um, I can't really speak to the the design process that the applicant went through to propose it. Uh, like I said before, the the city finds this design acceptable, and we'd be open to uh, we were <laughs> and and are through you know additional review process for changes. Um, we're looking for a trail. That's the most important thing to the city, how it uh, looks. We can work that out together. That's what we've attempted to do. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Rich, to, well, does the applicant want to answer that as well? You're more than welcome to. No, I'm good. Uh, Kelly's resp last response was the one I think I may have been looking for. <laughs> okay, uh, and the applicant's gonna respond real quick as well, Rich. Uh, Brian, thanks. Jeff Lake, Civil Design Consultants. Um, the, as Kelly mentioned, the uh, the trail connection appears on the uh, the city trail master plan, ProStar plan. Um, <clears throat> we we were asked to doesn't matter if you want to sure um, to make that connection. Uh, the question Rich asked about grades, um, the uh, and Brian, you're correct. There's like 74 feet elevation difference between the starting point and the end point. And if you do a straight line, it's going to result in grades of 16, 17 percent average. Um, the, the trails at a maximum five percent, and, and I say trail, it's it's um, it's intended to be a pedestrian use only walk. So it's essentially a sidewalk. And that's the maximum grade according to city standards, according to CDOT standards, according to AASHTO standards uh, for sidewalks um, with some, with a few exceptions. Uh, so we, the, the, our, our intent was to design something or show something that met um, reference standards or, or applicable standards. So that's what we've done. Which makes sense, but I just didn't know where the requirement was coming from. So thank you for that clarification. Yeah, you bet. Uh, Rich, did you have other questions as well? Uh, not at this time. Any other questions? Is there any public comment here on this agenda item tonight? Yep. Come on down, give us your name and address, and um, try and keep your comments to three minutes or less. Sounds good. My name's Alicia Johnston. I live at 1219 All Seasons Court. Um, we look directly out at this uh, property um, that we're meeting here tonight on, uh, in particular, when you first um, come off the rotary onto Broomtail. Um, I, we have several neighbors there. There's uh, two duplexes. We're in the porches that look out on that property. None of those owners are uh, presently uh, at their homes at this time, so I'm here. Um, 
So originally when we um, purchased the home and we looked into um, what was going to be buildable in front of us, that, that corner that we're talking about that has, and please excuse me if I don't use the right terms, but it has boxes, it has wires, it has, um, it's very steep slope as we're talking about and was not going to be buildable because it had expired. Um, we did not expect something to be built there. And so we were, we were notified that, um, it was coming before y'all. Um, uh, so that's one thing, um, is, is that concern is that that property is quite steep and surprisingly that someone would want to build on it and, that they would like to extend it to that to that very busy corner. Um, and then the other um, piece of what I'm not sure that I understand is that I thought it was zoned for LL1 and I'm hearing the word hotel. So I didn't realize LL, is it LL1? It's RR. RRR1, sorry. Um, RR1 is part of that, um, that you could put a hotel in. I thought that was residential and a hotel was not residential, but again, this is me trying to understand what's possibly going to happen outside our, our window. Um, and that's kind of it. Just to, I came here to get a better understanding. I've, I've talked to people um, in your office prior and, um, and I've tried to understand the plats and what's proposed. So any information, any other information I can get and, and to, make sure that you hear that we are not in favor of that uh, corner piece where the wires are and that steep elevation um, to be considered um, buildable. Um, that's why I'm here. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you, you very much. Is there any other public comment this evening? Seeing none, uh, we'll come back to Planning Commissioner questions, and I'll just ask for clarification. Uh, does the RR1 support uh, lodging uses? RR1 allows hotels as a conditional use. Uh, however, as I mentioned before, some uses uh, were approved with the PUD. I believe hotel is one of them as the commercial uses. Um, regardless, development of that type um, requires development review and will come before planning commission and city council. Um, so yes. Great. Thank you. Sorry, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, if you have a question later, you can always come to, to planning, planning staff. Um, maybe another follow-up question is, uh, the parcel two is considered buildable as part of this. I guess I even up until just now had it in my head that that was still mostly an out, out lot, but is that being proposed as a buildable lot in the future? Yes. And I'm having a hard time understanding that. Maybe somebody can help me real quick. By the time you put uh, front and rear setbacks on that, is there, is there room for a building on that lot? Okay. Probably all the question I have for now. If anybody else has any follow final follow-up questions? Seeing none, Rich, did you have any final questions? No. Uh, does the applicant have any final follow-up response of any kind? All good. Okay. And staff? Nothing to add. Thank okay. you. Close the public portion. Come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. Uh, from a discussion standpoint, I, I really support development um, on this the full 13 acres or whatever it is. It's a uh, uh, needed area. How you build on 30% slope is... Um, I guess problematic, but engineering can do anything. Uh, and what you can put there, uh, I don't know, the, I think the commercial opportunities would probably be pretty limited other than flat spots. Uh, access would be a problem, I would think. Uh, but uh, saying all that, I'm very favorable of, of development of, of this property. It's been not developed for quite a long time. 
Okay, I'll, I'll jump in on that too. Uh, yeah, how the, the standard came about when it did about steep slopes, I think is really interesting. And I know um, even in my time here as commissioner that there have been others who have suggested that we revisit that as to what its applicability is and, and if it's really required in order to create the erosion mitigation measures that I think are, are really the intent for it. Um, but it also still is what the code is. Um, and I'm kind of just more, this is my train of thought was, was that, but it is the code, but then looking at both the applicant's justification and staff's analysis as to the hardship as it relates to the road creating that when it was legally designed uh, in 2006, when it was, I think is very um, appropriate justification for the variance. And so I think it's supportable even though all of those other things. <laughs> um, so, so that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at on that. Is there a motion or other discussion? Yeah, I did, Brian. Rich. Yeah, uh, I support your guys' comments about uh, 30 degree slopes. It certainly seems if all the impacts can be mitigated, we need to address that. We talk about it every time we see one of these variances. Uh, the vision for this area has always been for high density development. I have no problem with that. And I also hope that any future development is going to address the trail connection, which would probably be unusable by any reasonable walker the way it's currently presented. Okay, thanks, Rich. Any other discussion or motion? Uh, I'll have a motion for approval, PL 20210017 with stated conditions. Second. Motion and a second. Any other discussion? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll chime in just a little bit regarding the, um, the, both the, future, the past plans, the expired plans, and uh, the current, what's being put forward. Um, you know, considering that the one lot was planned to be a hotel in the past, you know, public comment, not knowing that, uh, you know, it's, it, it really was kind of planned that way. And knowing that the even with the, the slopes as they are, this was always going to be developed. Um, so while I, I, I hear the public comment on you know, the slopes and the hotel and stuff like that, those were things that were planned uh, for a very long time. Um, so I appreciate that, that comment and you were heard, but I think it was planned. Um, I see splitting that one lot in the two lots does make it a little bit easier for developers to come in and sell or to buy and then develop. I concur with you that it would be a little difficult in that little narrow strip, <laughs> but Hey, you know, they make little homes too. So, um, you know, but everything that has been put forward um, to me, I, you know, I, I agree with everybody else. Development in this area is good. That's what it's meant for. And I would be um, in favor of this. Sounds great. Uh, I'll just add real quick, a couple of summary things um, that you touched base on the subject as well. And so did Rich. Uh, I, I was glad that there was not a, an effort to change the under underlying uh, vested zoning kind of densities and setbacks and things like that. I think keeping with the original proposal and that that's kind of almost even sound like the basis of the applicant uh, coming forward today, uh, I was very encouraged to see. I'm also very encouraged to see this uh, path take place. It is a important connection location. Um, and, and quite honestly, even though I would kind of agree with you, Rich, that the amount of, of uh, turns on there is uh, switchbacks on there makes it seem daunting, but I think a 70 foot long set of stairs is even more so. Uh, I actually don't have as much issue with it <laughs> as I think um, others others might. I think uh, it allows for 
at least somebody to be able to use it when the time is right, whether it's a stroller or probably not a bike, but honestly, you never know. Um, but all forms of usability, I, I think it's great. I, I kind of applaud the way that it's designed at the moment. Um, and I think that was all I had. Unless there's any other discussion, I will call the question. Aye. 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 Rich? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Do we have a director's report this evening? You might not be on. I'm very excited to share with you all that we have um, successfully hired a preservation planner after a couple of years of trying to recruit okay. um, and get somebody here. We will have uh, a new staff member joining us on October 3rd, and I'll be sure to introduce uh, you all to her when she joins us. Terrific. Yes. That's the, that's it. That's all I've got. That's still exciting. All right. Terrific. We'll move on to our old business. Lots of hearing minutes. We'll start with July 9th public hearing minutes, which I believe everybody was present for. Any motion, motion or discussion? to approve June 9th uh, planning commission meetings minutes. Second. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Rich. Uh, now June 23rd, public hearing minutes. And everybody was present. A motion to approve June 23rd meeting minutes. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next, jumping into July 14th, public hearing minutes. Uh, Rob, I believe you were absent. So there's a critical three-person vote. <laughs> a motion to approve uh, July 14th meeting minutes. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I can't vote on that because I wasn't present. Correct. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm present now. You're present now. And lastly, July 28th public hearing minutes where I was absent, another critical vote. Motion to approve July 28th public commission, uh, planning commission meeting minutes. Second. Motion and a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 That also passes. I believe that's it for us. If there's a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned at 612. Thank you very much.